Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Ginger Rogers in Kitty Foyle with Dennis Morgan and James Craig. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The last time Ginger Rogers starred in the Lux Radio Theater, she went directly from this stage to the preview of her picture, Kitty Foyle. We all wished her good luck, but by that time, luck had nothing to do with the case. Simple justice gave her the applause of critics and public. And finally, the Motion Picture Academy Award for the finest performance by any screen actress during the year. And tonight, as Ginger Rogers plays her greatest role for the first time on the air, she has the same two leading men you saw in the picture, Dennis Morgan and James Craig. Christopher Morley called his novel the natural history of a woman. And the RKO picture was exactly that. Few stories can take an audience so close to the inner secrets of a woman's heart. And certainly no woman ever had a more sympathetic portrayal than Ginger Rogers gives Kitty Foyle. An Academy Award is a recognition of the highest in quality. And we've tried to make every detail of our production match that. Of course, to start with, we had Lux Flakes. There's no question about quality there. And I believe the whole company has outdone itself to make this an unforgettable premiere here in the Lux Radio Theater tonight. You've inspired that effort by your genuine interest in every activity of this theater. And your loyalty to our product has told us better than anything else how sincere that interest really is. The reward we offer is the best plays and stars that we can find. And as far as Lux Flakes is concerned, as fine a product as modern science can devise. And now for the finest that Hollywood can devise. We raise the curtain on the first act of Kitty Foyle, starring Ginger Rogers as Kitty Foyle, Dennis Morgan as Wynne, and James Craig as Mark. Doesn't female independence mean anything to you girls? After all, what's the difference between men bachelors and girl bachelors? Men bachelors are that way on purpose. That was Kitty Foyle speaking. Kitty is young and pretty, but very wise, too. She works at Delphine's Beauty Salon in New York, where, in the employee's locker room, the girl's conversation turns invariably to one subject, the male of the species. Now it's 5.30, and the girls slip through the door to join the scurrying crowds on Fifth Avenue. Kitty, trim and inviting, stands near the curb, a coat collar turned up high against the driving snow. A taxi pulls up quickly, and a young man hops out. Sorry I'm late, Kitty, but we got a couple of emergency cases to hospital, and I had to stay. Been waiting long? No, just got here. Come on, get in. Mm -hmm. Step on it, driver. I'm in a hurry. Say, you must be as hungry as I am. Well, I'm afraid you're going to get a little hungrier, because I've got to catch another case first. Before dinner, Mark. Yes, emergency. Oh. Over in the tenement district. Matter of fact, we're racing the stork right this minute. Well, I hope we win. Now, 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 the world's not that bad, is it? Oh, it is. Well, you're awful pretty anyway. All finished. Oh, how's the mother doing? Pretty well. Kitty, you have no idea how right you look with a baby in your arms. I know how right I feel. What's his name? Well, they haven't decided. Well, you see, there, there isn't any father. Might have been better if he hadn't pulled through. Don't say that, Mark. It's always better to pull through. There's something about the way you said that that makes me... Kitty, will you take this ring? I mean, will you marry me? Mark. Well, you see, I've got a lot of money tied up in this little hoop. And, well, there's, there's no other way I can get any use out of it. Well, Kitty? Mark, can you find my finger in all these blankets? <laughs> Let me get something straight. 
You did say yes, didn't you? I mean, it's all clear and there's no confusion. You understood what I asked you. You asked me to marry you, didn't you? That's it, exactly. <laughs> I got it. That's why I said yes. Well, what I'm getting around to is that fellow in Philadelphia. Is that all over with? All over, Mark. You're not kidding yourself, are you? It wouldn't do either of us any good if you weren't sure about it. I'm sure, darling. Then we're getting married tomorrow. Why, doctor? Look, I've got to go back to the hospital now, but I'll check out at midnight. You meet me there with your bags packed, and we'll go straight to Gretna Green. Gretna Green? Sure. They've got a justice of peace that stays open all night, just like a drugstore. Can you be ready with them? And who says I can't? Okay, then meet me at St. Timothy's Hospital at 12, smack on the dot. 12, smack on the dot, St. Timothy's. Driver, Pocahontas Hotel for Women, West 34th Street. But it's the last time you'll have to take her there, I promise you that. Hello, Kitty. When? Surprised to see me? Uh, why, what are you doing out of Philadelphia on a night like this? How did you get in here? Men aren't allowed in this hotel, you know. The operator in the back elevator is corrupt. Oh, Wynn. Why did you come? You sent for me. I sent for you? This ring. The one I gave you. I told you if you ever needed me or wanted me, send it back. Oh, I forgot that isn't what I meant. I sent the ring back because that was all. That was the end. Don't say that, Kitty. Oh, but it's true, Wynn. You'll have to go. I can't go. Not until I've told you something. I'm sailing at midnight. Where? South America, Buenos Aires. I live there. Oh, with your wife? Alone. Unless you'll go with me. I've broken away for good. There's no life for me without you. I want you. I need you. I love you this minute as I've never loved you before. Oh, but when it's too late. Five years, too late. It'll never be too late, Kitty. What we've had can't die. You haven't forgotten, have you? Oh, I thought I had. I was sure I had. No, darling. We must never forget any of it. Kitty, I... I haven't much to offer except me. I tried to get a divorce, but I couldn't. I wish it were different, but that's the way it is. I see. Whatever you decide, I am sailing anyway. I, I'm hoping, I'm asking that we'll leave together. Be together always. Oh, Wynn, don't ask me anything. Don't let me think. Just take me with you. Darling. When do we go? We sail at midnight. I'll be at the pier with everything arranged. Will you meet me there? Yes, Wynn. Kitty, I love you. I'll have to hurry to get everything done. Don't be late. Oh, when? When you didn't tell me what boat, what pier? <laughs> Just like it always was. When I look at you, I can't think of anything else. Oh. It's Pier 48. Goodbye, darling. Don't be late. I won't. I'll be there 10 minutes ahead of time. Pier 48, midnight. Pier 48. You're making a mistake, you know. What? Here I am, over here in the mirror. I'm you, Kitty Foyle. And I think you're making a mistake. Am I? You're that little girl on the sleigh ride. Trouble is, you're no longer a little girl. You're a grown woman now. I'm only 24. You're 26. Don't try to kid me. Well, I'm not old anyway. And I know what I'm doing. It's a very unsatisfactory role you're preparing to play, even under the best of circumstances. We'll just have to face it. Correction. You'll have to face it. Married people face things together, but you won't be married. Did you ever think of it that way? Marriage isn't everything. What is it anyway? It's just a piece of paper like any other legal document. A lot of pretty fine things come out of that piece of paper, Kitty. A home, children. You'd be a lot happier with Mark and that little piece of paper than you ever could be with Wynne and a snug little apartment with a key for him and a key for you. You know what I think? I think you're wrong. I remember you using those same words before. Way back when you lived in a little house on Griscom Street in Philadelphia. That's where Pop brought you up and what a grand guy he was. It was the night of the Philadelphia Assembly. You were about 15 then. A gawky, long-legged kid. You came
came home late trying to sneak past the parlor and up the stairs without Pop seeing you. But he saw you all right. Kitty, Kitty, come in here. Hello, Pop. I was just... Come um, here. I was just... I know what you were just doing. There. The assemblies tonight. And you were downtown gazing at those rich mainliners, parading into the Bellevue Stratford and getting silly ideas. No, I wasn't, Pop. Really, I was watching. Kitty, yes, I... you've got to get this trash out of your head. Get your mind over that Tommy Rot in the society page. But it's not Tommy Rot, Pop. It's no more Tommy Rot than the Lady of Shalott. Who's she? You know. And sometimes through the mirror blue, the knights came riding two by two. She hath no loyal knight and true, the Lady of Shalott. Judas Priest! If you're not reading about those mainline monkeys, you've got your head stuck in a Cinderella book. Well, the Lady of Shalott wasn't exactly Cinderella, but it was the same idea. Oh, Pop, it must be wonderful. What? Well, you know, after you've been sitting in ashes all of your life, and then all of a sudden, a prince comes along. Judas Priest, if ever a man deserved to be hung, it's the fellow who started that Cinderella stuff, putting crazy ideas into girls' heads. Why, they're the ruination of more girls than 40 actors. Mm, I don't see where there's so much ruination about it. Cinderella and the prince lived happily ever after. They always do. Yes, and that's where those writing fellas are smart, too. They always end the story before it really begins. And that's the reason I'm going to get all this junk about the main line and the Philadelphia Assembly out of your head so that you won't make a fool out of yourself later on. You know what I think, Pop? I think you're wrong. Well, time moved on, and skirts got six inches longer, and they stopped playing Sunny Boy and took up Who's Afraid of the Big Bad Wolf, and then, boom, came the Depression. And you had to trade in a few of those dreams for a volume of Greg Shorthand, remember? You finally got a diploma from the Vesey School of Business, but you were still one of the vast army of unemployed until 1932, October 23rd. That's when you went to work for Wynn Strafford, Winwood Strafford VI, a true prince of the main line. Instead of a white horse, he had $10,000 his family had given him to start a magazine. Poor Wynn. He did so much want to do something on his own. You'd been there about two months. Miss Foyle, this isn't quite right. What's the matter? This letter you typed for me, it's wrong. The use of a squire in business is a New York affectation and very bad taste. But I've seen letters come to you addressed, Mr. Winwood Strafford-esque. From New Yorkers, perhaps. It's still wrong. Well, then I've certainly seen them just plain esque. Say, how does a person get to be an esquire anyway? Well, I don't know. He, he just is. Oh. Pop says you get to be an esquire if you can sit on one animal and chase another. Did I sound stuffy? I'm sorry. Pardon? Okay, get stuffy yourself. I've said I'm sorry. Did uh, you get my column off the dictaphone? Yes, and it's... It, what? Uh, nothing. Go ahead. What about it? Well, Don't be afraid. I was just thinking about the way your voice sounds on the dictaphone. You know who it sounds like? No. Who? Ronald Coleman. Huh. Really? <laughs> it's uncanny. <laughs> I played the record over and over again, and it's lovely. <laughs> That's funny. Yes. <laughs> so different from what it is, actually. Huh. Hmm. Ronald Coleman, eh? <clears throat> Do you really think it's true, Miss Foyle, that my voice sounds rather like that of Mr. Coleman? Ah, Shangri-La, Miss Foyle. Foyle, Foyle, Foyle and oil. And furthermore, it might be wise if... Oh, oh, come in, Miss Foyle. I, I was just trying a little dictation on the machine. I'd just like to say I'm sorry. I was fresh before. I, I didn't notice it. Well, uh, I was, and I'm sorry. Oh, it's quite all right. Uh, oh, you want to run that record off now? Oh, no, thanks. I was just figuring how it worked. Uh, well, I'll show you. It's really very It's not at all necessary, really. Don't you think you'd better pop out to lunch? Only uh, take ten seconds. Besides, what am I here for? Really, Miss Foyle, there's no need to... Th there, and you turn it on here, and then... You... Do you really think it's true, Miss Foyle, that my voice sounds rather like that of Mr. Coleman? Ah, Shangri-La, Miss Foyle. Foyle, Foyle, boil and oil. Roses are red. Violets are blue. Miss Foyle has nice legs. I love you. Is that all? And I'll thank you, Miss Foyle, 
not to look so beautiful during conferences. We have difficulties enough getting this magazine out without disturbing the personnel, particularly myself. I think I will go out to lunch after all. Now, wait a minute, please. Let me explain, will you? Win, win, boiling gin. I'm terribly sorry. Really, I I never intended. I, I mean, I was simply testing, you know, like on the radio. Will you please let me out? Miss Foyle, wait. I, uh... I want to give you some dictation before you go. Sit down, please. Well... Ah, uh, let's see. Inner office memo to Miss Foyle. <clears throat> I'm... I'm sorry I said you're too beautiful. But you are. I'm sorry I said uh, you disturb me. But you do. I'm sorry you seem to think I'm making love to you. But I am. There's no getting around it. Those were probably the happiest days in your whole life. Days when you and Wynn were still learning those little things about each other that make two ordinarily normal people a little daffy when they're together. Like the first time you went to New York, remember? He took you to Jono's. They had to have a car to get in in those days. They had a radio running full blast to get the election return. Mr. Strafford, I have this water bottle. I save it just for you. Thanks, Juno. Strega? Strega. What Strega? It's Italian brandy. Oh. They say that if two people drink it together, they'll never drink it apart. How cozy. Why so solemn, Kitty? Oh, I was just wondering. What about? Why did you bring me to New York? I thought you'd like it. Why? Because, well, you see, when I was going to school in Manitou, Illinois, it was a very small town, and everybody else knew everybody else's business. So when a man wanted to take somebody out, and he didn't care very much about being seen with her, he always took her up to Chicago. I see. But that's not it. I, I wanted to make a good impression on you. So I brought you where I thought I most likely could do it. Oh, I'm sorry if I... Kitty, uh -huh. I've got an idea. Will you go at the assembly with me this year? Are you kidding? I mean it, Kitty. This isn't just a gesture. I, I want you to come, please. Oh, Wynn. Have you ever had a dream come to life right in front of your very eyes? No, but I haven't given up hope. Is it a date? I'm crazy, I know, but it's a date. Kitty, lean close to me. I've got to kiss you. Attention, everybody. Republican National Headquarters have just conceded that the next president of the United States will be Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Yeah! Celebrating, celebrating about Hoover didn't win. <laughs> I'm celebrating our first kiss. Oh, you're crazy. Come on, we're getting out of here. Hey, what's the idea? Roosevelt's horning in on my celebration. <laughs> we're going to Lake Pocono <laughs> to see the sunset. Oh, but we're too late. It's already set. Okay, we'll see the moon rise. Come on. <laughs> We're in the Pocono Mountains, situated in the state of Pennsylvania, sitting in front of a fireplace, talking of nothing. No, but where are we really? In heaven? No. No? In love. Oh, tell me about love. First, there was a man, mm -hmm. and just as soon as he'd had time to learn his way about, there was a woman. Was the woman beautiful? Very. She had red hair, mm -hmm. and her nose went like so, mm -hmm. and her eyes, they were as blue-green as the sea itself. Mm, look quite a bit like me, huh? Mm, well, her voice didn't sound so much like music, and her eyes didn't trap the starlight one half as cleverly, and she wasn't nearly so beautiful. And what did the man and the woman do? Well, at first they just hung around. Mm -hmm. They didn't take any notice of each other at all. Oh, maybe a grunt now and then, <laughs> but certainly nothing more. And then one night, a strange thing happened. What? The man and woman were sitting in front of a fire. Uh -huh. The firelight played upon the woman's face. Uh -huh. And the man, for the first time, saw how beautiful she was. Looking into her eyes, he suddenly beheld all the wonders of life. So immediately, he made love to her. How? 
Well, first he bent down over her <laughs> and rubbed her nose with his, like this. Didn't the woman object? No. Mm -hmm. She loved him, too. Why? Well... Because he was everything that she had ever dreamed of. Maybe. Oh, let me see. Where was I? You were just about to kiss me. Did he? Pop, what are you Did doing he? up? Didn't Dr. Cartwright tell you to stay in bed? Dr. Cartwright is a quack. Shot, shot, and who said he wasn't? Now get over on that couch and stay there. Oh, all right. You're I'm all going right. to the office now. I'll be out for dinner tonight, but I'll come home first. Kitty. Yes, Pop. Have you got time to sit down a minute? Mm -hmm. What's on your mind, Pop? Wynn Strafford. Oh. Kitty, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be around here. Pop. And I don't know how much good I could do anyway. Kitty, I thought I had all this junk rooted out of your mind. What junk? Cinderella and her blasted prince. Don't you see, Kitty? It's no good. Pop, you might as well try to argue me out of a case of bronchitis because that's the way it is. I love him. Judas Priest. You said it. You mean you want to marry him? Mm-hmm. Has he ever asked you yet? No, but... No, and he never will. But he loves me, Pop. I know it. And I'll let you in on a little secret. A man can... A woman can always tell when a man's going to propose. You mean woman's instinct. Mm -hmm. Judas Priest, now there's a real piece of idiocy. Now, goodbye. Woman's instinct. Goodbye, darling. I've got to go to work. So long, Pop. Now, don't worry about it. I'll take care of myself. All right. Take care of yourself. By Judas Priest, you're going to break your heart. You in the office already, Wynn? That's not like you. Morning, darling. What's the matter? You ever heard of a thing like the Depression? Yes, isn't it disgusting? It always comes around when people are so broke. Well, it's here, right here in this office. Huh? Our little magazine's folding up Saturday. Oh, when? Your boss is a flop. Well, don't say that, darling, because it's not true. Well, sit down and tell me about it. Ah, uh, there's not much to tell. I got the idea for this rag because, well, I, I didn't like following the family in the groove. I still don't. I thought this might be the answer if I could swing it, mm -hmm. but I couldn't. Well, now listen to me, Wynn. I don't like this flop stuff from you. You're a nice big boy with the right number of arms and hands, legs, and plenty of brains, and... You needn't expect me to break into tears over the first little setback you get. But don't you see I'm, I'm washed up? Wynn Strafford, if you talk like that again, I give you my word, I'll pop you right in the nose. Oh, you're different, Wynn. You're going somewhere. What about you? Me? What will you do? Oh, that's right. <laughs> I'm out of a job. <laughs> I'd forgotten about that. Well, I might get one in New York. A friend of mine lives up there. I can't let you do that. Why not? Because it's just silly, that's all. I... Besides, we'd be too far apart. Well, it isn't China. Kitty, hmm? this is kind of delicate, but... Yeah, go on. Your father's pretty sick. Uh -huh. You're all alone, and it's too much for you to handle. What I mean is I feel I'm kind of responsible. So, well, um, until you can get another job, boy, you won't have to worry about money. What do you mean? I'll just keep you on the payroll. It's only fair, you know, Just because I... Just a minute. I... You don't have to worry about me, Wynn. I'm free white and 21, or almost. And I'll love you from here on out until I stop loving you. But nobody owes a thing to Kitty Foyle except Kitty Foyle. You win. <laughs> yeah, it was just like you said, Pop. One of us couldn't make the grade. Pop. Pop, do you hear me? Are you asleep? Pop. Pop. Pop, wake up! Pop! Oh, Pop. <laughs>
Mr. DeMille brings us Act Two of Kitty Foyle, starring Ginger Rogers, Dennis Morgan, and James Craig, in just a moment. And now, Lou Silvers is going to illustrate for us one fact about new Quick Lux Flakes. See if you can guess what it is. Thanks a lot, Lou, for playing that familiar tune two different ways. First, very slowly, then three times as fast. You see, that's a way of telling our audience one difference between new Quick Lux and other leading soaps. In water as cool as your hand, it dissolves three times as fast as any of ten other leading soaps tested. Not just twice as fast, three times as fast. Yes, and that's not all. New Quick Lux is thrifty, too. Gives such rich, abundant suds that a little goes a long, long way. And of course, it's pure and gentle. Has no harmful alkali to fade colors or hurt fabrics. It's safe for anything safe in water alone. Speed, thrift, and safety are three good reasons why New Quick Lux is America's favorite care for nice things. Why twice as many women use Lux for pretty washables as use any other flakes, chips, or beads. Be sure to keep a big box handy all the time to keep your nice things lovely longer. The quick, thrifty Lux way. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Act two of Kitty Foyle, starring Ginger Rogers as Kitty Foyle, Dennis Morgan as Wynne, and James Craig as Mark. Kitty Foyle has told Wynne Strafford that she will sail with him to South America. In her hotel room, as she packs her grips, the voice of her conscience will not be still. It bites deep into her soul reviewing her life up to this moment. After Pop died, it was goodbye to Philadelphia and all that part of your life. And why New York? <laughs> all right, kid, let's face it. It was because New York reminded you of Wynn. And you hoped he'd come and find you. That was when you started to work for Delphine Tatia, selling seductive perfumes to fat women. Then came the day when you punched a button that was supposed to ring the stock room, remember? How did you know it was the fire alarm? Oh, my gosh, I guess I did something wrong. You said it, sister. But you will I do? What you don't want to lose your job. Just faint. Well, here I go, baby. Oh, oh she fainted. We'll get a doctor. Get a doctor. Miss Delphine, the ambulance is here. Okay, okay. Where's the patient? Right over there, doctor, lying on the floor. What happened to her? She just, uh, she just fainted. Thanks. Stand back, please. Mm-hmm. Pulse normal. Respiration normal. Let's see. Any bones broken? No. Yeah. What's the matter? Hurt when I push your ribs? Hey, lay off, lay off. Oh, faking, eh? Yeah, now be a good guy and go away. I've got just the thing here for what ails you. A nice, long hypo needle. Listen, you dope, there's nothing wrong with me, and I'll lose my job if they find out I turn in that fire alarm. Well, maybe we better talk it over. How about a date tonight? No. Okay, I'll try to inject this needle so it won't hurt you. If Much. you do, I'll scream. And lose your job? All right, you win. It's a date? Yes. Where do you live? 1622 Rex Hill, apartment 317. Eight o'clock, all right? It's a little late for dinner, isn't it? We'll make it eight o'clock just the same. Is she all right, doctor? Here, here is water. Hold her head up. <gasps> ah, there, now, now, that helped. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. And how is our little patient this evening? If you have reference to me, all right. Oh, I'm fine, too. Who asked? Mind if I step in? Thanks. Hmm, I see you've got your coat on. And my hat. Shall we go? 
You know, once you get to thinking about it, that was a very funny way we met this afternoon. Now, wait a minute, Doctor. I agreed to a date, and I'm going to keep my word. But if you think I'm going to sit here and join you in a jolly laugh over that trick of yours, you're on the wrong trapeze. Well, I'm sorry. I just thought we might sit around and reminisce. It's a nice little place you got here. Nice place we've got here. I share it with two other girls. Oh. In times like these, what could be better? Oh, pardon me. I just want to get my cold cream. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be in the bathroom if you want me, Kitty. Was uh, that one of them? Oh, that's Molly. I'm sorry I forgot to introduce you. Never give it a second thought, but... Excuse me, but did you see my orange stick? Oh, Pat, this Oh, here it is. Uh, this is Dr. Uh, uh, Miss Day, Dr. How do you do? Pleased to meet you. Sorry for intruding. Say, what is this, a gag? What's the matter? Well, all of those instruments sticking up out of their hair. Oh, those are curlers. The girls are just relaxed, that's all. Well, I've seen better specimens in glass jars. Well, what's your program, Doctor? Well, you like to play cards? No. And besides, we haven't any. Well, it's a funny thing, but just as chance would have it, I've got a couple of decks right here in my pocket. Now, isn't that a coincidence? Yes, isn't it? Double solitaire? Thank you. I just love it. <laughs> Well, I win again. Let's see, that's uh, 17 games to three. Swell coffee. Yeah, it's a little too strong. It's been keeping me awake. Do you mind my asking you something? I thought we had a date tonight. Well, what do you think's been going on here for the last three hours? Well, for one thing, I've slowly grown to hate you. Me? But, but why? Because I'm hungry. Because I thought you were going to take me out to dinner. But how could I when all I got's a dime? Well, we could go out and spend that. <laughs> you've, uh, you've taken an awful beating, haven't you? You ought to know. Well, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but all of this has been kind of a test. You mean you were testing me? No, don't make it sound so awful. It's just that the girl I fall for mustn't be a gold digger. I simply haven't got the dough for it. So I've always told myself I'd never fall for one unless I could get to liking her without spending any money. That's just for the first evening, understand? Mm -hmm. Well, then, um, how did I come out? Well, uh, you're okay. Mm. I'd like to point out that anything I did to prove that to you was purely unintentional. I know that. But uh, how about going to the movies Friday night? Sorry, I can't afford it. Oh, forget that. I'll pay. <laughs> Coal oil Johnny, eh? And the bus both ways. <laughs> Well, I never thought I'd fall for a flashy front, but okay, it's a date. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Good night. Hurry up, Kitty. There's a bus coming. Oh, that I wanted to get a paper. What do you still buy the Philadelphia paper for? You haven't been back there for almost a year. Oh, I just like to keep up with the old town, I guess. <laughs> you mean you like to keep up with the old boyfriend? Molly, look. Philadelphia prepares for annual assembly tonight. The assembly. Wynn will be there in his shining armor. Yeah, and you'll be going out with Mark in his shining stethoscope. <laughs> Come on! Mark, what is this? Don't ask me. The joint's filled with flowers. <laughs> Why, they've been coming in all afternoon. <laughs> I don't know who sent them. Look, there's ten telegrams. They're all unsigned. <laughs> It's Wynn. It's Wynn. I know it's Wynn. The night himself. Oh, please, kids, please beat it. Okay, please. I'll take the bathroom. And I'll take the terrace. Let him in. Come in. Hello, darling. Oh, why, Wynn. Kitty. Oh, Wynn, darling, I just got in and I saw all these flowers and I just knew, oh, I knew that... Oh, how did you find me? I just followed my heartbeats. Oh. Shall I go outside while you change your dress? A dress? We have a date tonight for the assembly, remember? Only ours is going to be right here in New York. Oh, when? Kitty, I think I forgot to tell you. Tell me what? How much I love you. Well, how much do you love me? If I said as much as you love me, would uh, that be enough? Oh, darling, if that were true, there wouldn't be enough love left for anyone else in the whole world. How much longer do we keep this place open? Don't ask me, I only lead the orchestra. That guy over there has rented the joint till 5 a.m. That's when some dance in Philadelphia ends. And 
wouldn't to think that only 24 hours ago it started out just like any other old day in the year. Kitty. Yes, when? Kitty, I, I brought something for you. Huh? It's just an old ring, but I'd like you to have it. Oh, it's pretty. What is it, an heirloom? It was my great-grandmother's. Oh. You see that design? Mm -hmm. It's a symbol of eternal life, from her to me and you, to those that come after us forever. It's our family. Oh, well, you'd better put it away, then, if it's family stuff. Boys, can you play Tales from the Vienna Woods? Yeah, but feebly. I don't know why I should need all this background, but, Kitty, will you marry me? Oh, when? Will you? No, dear. Don't you love me? Yes. But you won't marry me. <laughs> but why not? Oh, Wynn, darling, we're happy now, aren't we? I mean, here, this minute. Of course we are. Well, you know why? Because we love each other. Because we're together. No, that's not it. It's because we're not in Philadelphia. No, look, honey, this is no time for bum jokes. In New York, we're happy. At Pocono, we're happy. In Seattle and New Orleans and Dallas, Texas, we could be happy, but not in Philadelphia. In Philadelphia, you're Darby Mill, and I'm Griscombe Street. We're two addresses, 23 miles, and 500 light years apart. And is that all? <laughs> We're the same color, if that's what you mean. <laughs> all right, then. It's all fixed. We'll be New Yorkers from now on, both of us. Are you kidding, Wynn? No, darling, I mean it. Oh. This is where we'll live, where we'll be happy. Oh, I'm happy already. I'm so happy I can't tell you how much. Oh, kiss me, Wynn. Oh, I hope the alarm doesn't ring for just a little while longer. I do want life to be beautiful, just as it is now. And so you were married, Mr. and Mrs. Winwood Strafford the Sixth. Remember, you read it over and over when Wynn wrote it on the register of that little hotel in Gretna Green. There's no use denying it. Those two days were just about perfect. And then you went back to Philadelphia to tell Wynne's family. After you, Mrs. Strafford. Good evening, Mr. Strafford. How are you, Harrison? Where's Mother? You'll find the whole family having tea in the drawing room, sir. Come on, Kitty. Don't let old Uncle Kenneth scare you. <laughs> He's an old Quaker banker. Only knows three words. Thee, thou, and no. <laughs> Go ahead. Hello, everybody. Wynn, dear, come in. You remember Kitty, Mother. Indeed, I do. It's so nice to see you again, Miss Foyle. Thank you. You remember my grandmother? Yes. Aunt Jessica, yes. Uncle Edgar, and Uncle oh, Kenneth? How do you do? Happy to see thee again, Miss Foyle. The fact is, the name isn't Foyle anymore. It's, it's Strafford. Kitty and I have been married. Married? Well, why don't you say something? Well, you'll have to forgive me, but I just wasn't prepared for such news. When were you married, dear? Last Saturday. But I thought you were going to send her to school first. Mother, my dear, Wynne has already told us how much he loves you, and we couldn't have been happier for his sake. But I thought he was going to wait for a year. Yes, Mother. You understand, of course, that above everything else, we want you and Wynne to be happy. That's first and foremost in all our thoughts. Oh, yes, of course well, it I, is. Yes. I don't yes, want to yes, seem yes, rude, yes, but yes. would somebody mind telling me what you all are driving at? Well, it's only this, my dear. I'll tell her, Mother. You see, honey, I promised that I wouldn't marry you for a year. Mother was going to take you under her wing and, well, prepare you. Prepare me for what? Oh, you know, some school, some, some good finishing school. School? Are you kidding me? Oh, it needn't be a school, and it can still be done. Later on, we can have a proper wedding. And what do you call what we've just done, a rehearsal? Now, wait a minute, Kitty. Doesn't she want to go to school? School is out, definitely. I'm a big girl now. Wynn and I are not going to live in Philadelphia. Oh, I'm Griscom Street, and he's Mainline, and we both know it. In Philadelphia, that's fatal. Anywhere else in the world, it doesn't make a nickel's worth of difference, and so that's where we're going to live. And anywhere else in the world. That's right, isn't it, Wynn? Of course it is, dear, but it seems to me we this could... This is all very provoking. But, Miss Foyle, thou must realize that such a thing is impossible. Why? It happens that the Strafford money is a trust fund established by family wills. They provide that when, when he takes unto himself a wife, 
shall reside in Derby Mill and assume his duties as an officer of the family bank. Now, those terms are irrevocable. And if Wynne refuses? In that case, his inheritance would pass into the family trust. Well, so what? So Wynne isn't rich anymore. So what is that to me? I didn't marry him for his money. I don't care if he hasn't got a penny. But, Miss Foyle, thou art not being quite reasonable about this. Says thou. Miss Foyle, thy temper. Mr. Kenneth, thy foot. Let's get a few things straight around here. I didn't ask to marry a Strafford. A Strafford asked to marry me. I married a man, not an institution or a trust fund or a bank. Oh, I've got a fine picture of your family conference here. All the Straffords trying to figure out how to take the curse off Kitty Foyle, buy the girl a phony education, and polish off the rough edges and make a main line doll out of her. Oh, you ought to know better than that. It takes six generations to make a bunch of people like you, and by Judas Priest, I haven't got that much time. <laughs> After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille will present Act Three of Kitty Foyle, starring Ginger Rogers, Dennis Morgan, and James Craig. Now, here's Libby Collins, our fashion reporter, with a story about a new kind of fashion show. Say, Libby, that's a very good-looking suit you're wearing. Thanks, Mr. Ruick. I think so, too. It's borrowed right out of the fashion show you mentioned. It's made of Glen Plaid seersucker. That's cotton, you know. All the things in the show are cotton. Well, if they're all as good-looking as that, Libby, they'll get my vote. I think the clothes in the show will make a lot of people feel that way, Mr. Ruick. Make them realize that cottons today are really fine fabrics, just like lovely silks and rayons. And, of course, they shouldn't be washed any old way. But they can be luxe. Yes, indeed. Everything in this style show is cotton and luxable, from play dresses to street suits to evening gowns. And they're the smartest things you could find anywhere, too. They were chosen by one of the leading fashion magazines, Harper's Bazaar. Sounds like an exciting show. It is, Mr. Ruick. It's a flying fashion show with a lovely girl from Tennessee, Miss Alice Beasley, as its star. Miss Beasley was chosen as the maid of cotton, specially to take the very latest cotton styles on a 14,000-mile flying fashion tour. She's stopping off at leading stores all over the country to model them. And with her goes a luxe fashion expert to tell women how to keep these smart clothes smart. Well, I think a lot of people in our audience would like to know where they can see the show, Libby. Well, this week, the Maid of Cotton will be in Cleveland, Ohio, and Fort Wayne, Indiana. And then? Then she flies to Memphis, Tennessee for the Cotton Carnival, and then to New York City for National Cotton Week, which starts May 16th. Newspapers in the cities where she stops will announce the time and place of the shows. Thank you, Libby, for a very interesting story. And ladies, remember... Today's colorful cottons need the same gentle care that is America's favorite for all nice washables, new quick Lux flakes. You see, gentle Lux care leaves dresses fresh and dainty, keeps colors new looking longer. Anything safe in water is safe in Lux, you know. So avoid cake soap rubbing, soaps with harmful alkali. Stick to new quick Lux. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille, Curtain rises on the third act of Kitty Foyle. The hands of the clock lift slowly toward twelve, the hour that Kitty is supposed to meet Wynne at the boat. But the voice inside her goes on relentlessly, bringing back all of the past. It's been a long time since I've seen you. Too long. Yes. There's something I want to tell you. You always show up at the wrong time, Mark. Why? You knew I was married. Yes. Well, I'm not anymore. I got my decree today. Funny. It started out, the people of this free state send you greetings. Still love him, Kitty? I'm afraid so. What was the matter? Why didn't it turn out better? 
Mm, I couldn't live his life, and he couldn't live mine. It's simple as that. Is uh, there any chance for me? I'm afraid not. You know I love you, don't you? Yes. Well, we could go out to dinner once in a while and see a show afterwards. I can afford seats downstairs now. Mark, I'd like to, but all the time we'd be together, I'd be thinking of him. And You're too nice to be pushed around, so it's only fair for me to tell you. I see. Let's, let's say goodbye here, Mark. Kitty, if there's anything you ever want, well, you know you can call on me, don't you? Yes, I know that. I'm a pretty good doctor, Kitty. But seeing you now, I... I wish I'd specialized in heart trouble. Began to find out about them that there's a lot of living to do in the world. And if you're worthwhile, you get hurt. Then there was the day you went to the doctor. Come back in about a week, Mrs. Boyle. You hardly knew if you were glad or sorry. You went back to Delphine's in a Oh, Kitty, my dear. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm late, oh. Delphine. Oh, that's all right, my little friend. Only there was a long-distance call for you. Really? Mm, just a few minutes ago. Call Philadelphia Operator 12. It's Wynn. Oh. <laughs> oh, Kitty, you're so excited. Hello, Operator 12, please. Well, how long ago? Um, Hello. Uh, did you have a Philadelphia call for Miss Foyle? Oh, thank you. It is Wynn. It must be Wynn. Hello. Who is it? Oh, Wynn. Yes, Wynn. Yes. Of course we can have a talk. Where? Uh-huh. Uh, 5.30 at Giono's. Uh-huh. Well, I'll be there. Yeah, goodbye. Oh, I'll be there. Is everything all right? Oh, yes. Oh, I'm awfully sorry I was late, Delphine, but I had to go to the doctor's office. Hmm? Are you ill? No. Well, then what's the matter? Well, when I left his office, he called me Mrs. Foyle. Oh, my dear. Can I help you? No, it's all right, Delphine, because don't you see, Wynne called. But did you tell him? Does he know? Oh, of course he knows. I mean, of course he doesn't know. But he called me, and I'm going to see him this afternoon. Oh, this is just what he needed. It's just what I needed, too. Me and Wynne and something to fight for. <laughs> afternoon, Miss Foyle. Hello, Giono. Mr. Strafford, he called, he says, Strega, one <laughs> bottle and uh, two glasses. I think I'll have milk. Uh, milk? Yes. But when you have a good Strega, why should you want milk? Well, I don't want him growing up to be a dipsomaniac, do I? Beg your pardon? Uh, just milk. All right, milk. Giono? Yes? Grade A milk. That's when you saw the newspaper. It was lying on the table. Mr. and Mrs. Joyce Gladwin announced the engagement of their daughter, Miss Veronica Gladwin, to Mr. Winwood Strafford the Sixth. Win. You milk, Miss Foyle. Oh, I'm sorry. I don't. I don't want it now. But Miss Foyle. No, I'm no, be... please. I. I got to leave. But Mr. Strafford, what am I going to tell him, eh? Tell him. Tell him that I hope the first one's a boy. What is the matter, dear? Wynne is going to be married again. This time to somebody who's right for him. Not to me. Then he doesn't know? You didn't tell him? No. Nope. Well, obviously, somebody must. No. No, I, I wouldn't want it that way. No, he'd feel gallant and conscientious. And there's no happiness for anybody in a marriage like that. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to have this baby. Oh, but, Kitty, every child has a right to a name. He'll have a name. He's Wynne's son. He's legally entitled to the name of Strafford, but I'll give him a better name. The doctor called me Mrs. Foyle, so I'll call the baby Foyle. I'll call him Tom Foyle after my pop. And he'll grow up to be proud of his name and proud of his mother. And by Judas Priest, he'll be a fighter, too. Hard as a pine knot. Tom Foyle the toughest kid in the block. Delphine, Delphine, is, this, is it over? Yes, dear. It's over. 
You don't need to tell me. I know. It's a boy. Yes, Kitty. It's the funniest thing you get so dopey. All the time it seemed I was dreaming that he was drowning and I was swimming after him, trying to keep his little head above water. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Yes, Kitty. And then it seemed like I heard him cry. <laughs> I'll bet his lungs are awful good, aren't they? He cried good and loud, didn't he, Delphine? Yes. Uh, when are they gonna let me have him? I just wanna hold him, just to make sure he's safe. Kitty. Delphine. 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 Please, Kitty, Delphine. you must rest now. Oh, I, I don't want to rest, I want my son. Where is he? Oh, Delphine, he isn't. Yes. He isn't. Yes, little one. I had a baby once. Oh, he died, no. too, before he was born. Oh, oh, my baby. Oh, my poor, poor baby. Time kept on doing business at the same old stand. Five years of it. Then Delphine sent you down to Philadelphia to open a branch in that department store. You were afraid to go, afraid of all the things it might bring back. But nothing happened until the afternoon of your last day, at about half past four. I'm wearing gold net over white satin with insertions of green lace on the skirt. I'm a little worried about my eyes, because you see, they're green, too. Mm-hmm. I think a touch more orange in your lip bruise would bring out the gold in your eyes. Oh, that's a very good idea. Hello? Oh, Mrs. Strafford? Oh, that's for me. <laughs> Thank you. Hello? Oh, hello, Wynne. <laughs> oh, you don't have to go to New York again, do you? But, but when in the five years we've been married, we've never gone to the assembly together. Mother... Are we going to buy a present? Just a minute, dear. Uh, well, wait till I get home then, will you? All right, Wynn. I'm sorry, but I'll have to leave right away. Mommy, are we going home? Yes. Well, you told me I could buy Daddy a birthday present. We'll get it tomorrow. I forgot my teddy bear. My teddy oh, bear. Here it is. I was just going to bring it to you. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. I bet I bet I can tell you what your name is. Bet you can't. It's Wynn Strafford. Winwood Strafford the Seventh. How do you know? I, I understand little boys pretty well. You see, I used to know a little boy once. He'd be just about your age now. What was his name? I think his eyes might have been just like yours. I've got eyes just like my daddy's, only he's big. Do you want a birthday present for your daddy very badly? Oh, yes. He always gives me one. Well, here's... Here's something you can give him. It's a ring, but it's got to be a secret. A secret? Just for your daddy. Now, shh. Shh. Yes, that ring, dear, come along. I forgot my teddy bear. Oh, uh, miss, uh, may I have your name? I'd like to go over this color scheme with you some other time. I'm sorry. You see, we're not allowed to give out our names. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. Goodbye. Goodbye, Mrs. Strafford. That's the record up to date. And now you're thinking of going to South America with Wynne. And Mark's waiting for you at St. Timothy's. There's not much time, Kitty Foyle. Make up your mind. Because this is forever. Well, what's it going to be? Oh, who is it? Bags ready, miss? Oh, uh, come right in. All set, Miss Foyle? Yes, th those bags over there. Have you the right time? It's a quarter to twelve. Oh, thank you. Uh, please take the bags downstairs and call a cab for me. All ready, Miss Foyle. Mighty sorry to lose you. Thank you, Joe. We don't get very many pretty girls here. Oh, Joe. Uh, yes? I think a, a, a young man will call for me sometime after midnight. Uh, just a minute. I, I better write this down. He'll be quite excited, I think, and very insistent. Yeah? I want you to tell him that... I admire him very much, and I always will. You admire him very much? And tell him I'll never forget him. You will never forget him. And tell him 
I'll always love him in a very special way. You'll always love him? And tell him that I'm being married tonight. You're getting married tonight. Driver. Hey, what is this? Driver, St. Timothy's Hospital, please. Well, Judas Priest. In a moment, Mr. DeMille brings back our stars for their curtain calls. Meantime, Sally, the little rascal, made me a bet last week. Yes, I bet Mr. Ruick that he couldn't write a last line for a limerick. Here it is. When Sue got a run in her stocking, Betty explained it is shocking the way that you rub your hose in a tub. No stocking can take such hard knocking. <laughs> a pretty good rhyme. <laughs> and at the same time... Oh, well, advice that no girl should be mocking. She's wise if she ducks. With fast, gentle lux. Continual runs in her stocking. <laughs> <laughs> well, seriously, that is just what stocking experts themselves, the makers of lovely silk and nylon hosiery, recommend. Lux Flakes. Listen to the significant fact. Over 90%, specifically 721 out of the 783 makers of stockings in the United States, recommend Lux. And women's own experience backs them up because new quick Lux Flakes have become America's favorite care for stockings the country over. Why? First, they're so gentle. They save the elasticity that makes stockings fit and wear. Second, they're faster. You get suds in a flash, and that saves you time. Third, new quick lux is thrifty. A little goes so far, gives such suds even in hard water. New quick lux comes in the same familiar package, costs you no more, and what good service it will help you get from lovely stockings. Now, here's Mr. DeMille and our stars. Radio, alas, has not yet established its equivalent of an Academy Award. If it had, we'd present it right now to Ginger Rogers as she returns to the microphone with Dennis Morgan and James Craig. Thank you, Mr. DeMille, but I think any medals that are knocking around should be pinned on Miss Kitty Foyle herself. <laughs> what would you suggest looking for, Ginger? Well, any large office building in any American city would do it, Dennis. Well, that's a pretty big order, Ginger. Well, I think you'd find several million girls like Kitty Foyle, Jim. They have their own brand of courage and don't ask favors from anybody. <laughs> mm, from our mail, I should judge that a high percentage of them are regular members of this audience and that they've all been asking for Kitty Foyle. Ginger, you've played just about every kind of part an actress can play on the screen, from dancing to drama. What's it going to be next? Well, it's a comedy called Tom, Dick, and Harry. Can't you get Dennis, Jim, and Cecil in that? <laughs> <laughs> it's too late, Mr. DeMille. We've just finished making it at RKO. Well, what about next Monday night, Mr. DeMille? You got a play yet? Mm -hmm. I should say we have got a play. A play that won the Pulitzer Prize on Broadway and later became a motion picture hit. It's Craig's Wife. And our stars will be Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall. Craig's wife is a sharp, dramatic story of a woman who was a little late in discovering the importance of love. A story that demands fine acting. And that's why we're presenting Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall at this microphone next Monday night. It's a fine play, Mr. DeMille, and I, for one, will be right by my radio next week. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Hear that? That's the greatest award there is, the applause of a nation. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Rosalind Russell and Herbert Marshall in Craig's Wife. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Dennis Morgan appeared tonight through the courtesy of Warner Brothers Studio and will soon be seen in their production of Affectionately Yours. James Craig is currently making the RKO picture The Devil and Daniel Webster, produced and directed by William Dieterle. The RKO picture, K Kitty Foyle, was produced by David Hempstead and directed by Sam Wood. Our music is directed by Louis Silvers and your announcer has been Melville Roy.
This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.